Okay, thank you everyone um, for joining us in this uh, online event to share our memories of Professor Naftali Tishbi. And I think this is the last time I'm going to call him Naftali and just refer to him as Tali from now on. I'm gonna start things um, by just very uh, briefly going over Tali's uh, CV. Um, and I'm doing this for the reason that even though Tali, Tali's life was cut short tragically, I just want us all to appreciate how much he managed in that short lifetime, more than many of us will achieve in much longer time periods. Tali was born in 1952 here in Jerusalem. He studied uh, right behind me here in Leada High School. Uh, and he was interested in science from a very early age in physics. He won his first scientific award at the age of 14. He joined the Israeli Defense Forces in 1971. He won the Israeli Security Award. And maybe we'll hear later from me about that time. Uh, he did his uh, master's thesis while he was in the army at Tel Aviv University and his PhD in theoretical physics here at the Hebrew University. He then left for two postdocs, the first of which was at MIT and then the second at Bell Labs. And it was during this postdoc that he made the, the transition from physics to machine learning, which is what he would study basically for the rest of his life. Although you might remember that he always took pain to uh, refer to himself as a physicist, even when he was doing machine learning. And he was a faculty member here at the Hebrew University from 1991 until he died. He gave so much to our community. Uh, he mentored over 35 graduate students and postdocs. Uh, he was among the founders, and maybe we'll hear more about this later from Ellie, from, of the Interdisciplinary Center for No Computation, which later became ELSIC. He was the founder of the engineering program here at the Hebrew University. He served on the board of Leada High School, the same high school where he studied. And he made countless uh, contributions to Israeli security, uh, really until the very last year of his life. Today is not a scientific meeting, it's more of a personal meeting. I'm sure we'll have scientific meetings devoted to Tali's work. But I just very briefly want to talk about the highlights of Tali's career. I think his most cited and influential work was the information bottleneck method with Fernando, Bill, Nam, and many others. And we'll hear about that. In the last decade or so, uh, he was very active in trying to connect the information bottleneck method with deep learning. Uh, and he had this long-term project about information theory and the definition of life. He was actually planning to write a book on this. Uh, and when Amir and Daphne and I visited him three weeks before he died, he was still very excited about this topic and still working on it and thinking about it, how to use information theory to define what life is. Okay, so I'll, I'll, that's sort of my, the end of my formal part of my talk. Let me just say a, just a few words from a personal standpoint. Um, Tali was a major reason that I'm here at the Hebrew University. I had a long conversation with him in 1998 when I was on the job market and deciding whether or not to come to Israel or to be, stay in the US. And Tali got, this was at NEC at Princeton, Tali got up and started writing equations on the blackboard and explaining why the information curve is monotonic. And he was a full professor at the time. I remember thinking, I don't know many full professors anywhere in the world who are still so active in their research, uh, still know every equation and every epsilon and what they're doing. And if that's the way full professors are at the Hebrew University, that's how I want to do, that's where I want to be. And I can say that over the years, uh, this wasn't an act. I had many, many conversations with him at the Menza, at the cafeteria, driving together to all sorts of places. And he was always so excited about his research, so into the research, always, uh, even again in that, that visit a few weeks before he died at his house, he was explaining to us about the monotonicity of different curves and what is convex and what is concave. And that is certainly how I'll remember him as someone who was always a scientist and I will, of course, miss him very much. Mary, you're next.
מאיר? still mute, sorry, okay, yeah. Um, Tali and I go way back. I know Tali since uh, 1975, so it's uh, more than 46 years. Uh, we actually met in the Israeli army. Um, at first I knew him from far away, but uh, for two years, in 79 and, I, and 80, he was actually my commander in the army, in the 8200 8, 8, units. Um, actually, when he left, I replaced him uh, until uh, I left the army uh, in 82. Um, it, it was an amazing time. We were young, enthusiastic. We didn't know a lot, or, but we thought we, 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 we know everything. And we talked about uh, information theory and signal processing. I just learned information theory. Um, all the time, very excited. Um, and one thing that I remember from that time, um, he was the physicist. Uh, I was the engineer. I learned, uh, I did my undergraduate in uh, electrical engineering, also in physics, in electrical engineering, also in physics. But it was Tali that was running around, uh, always had the tester, and um, uh, he was always fixing things and fixing uh, broken hardware. And I was clueless. I didn't know how to, uh, uh, what to do. Actually, in every meeting since then, um, every time I met Tali, he showed me a new gadget and he knew how to operate it. I don't. And uh, so I am really clumsy, but he was the real engineer. Um, we go to the next slide. Um, at that time, we were in the army, but uh, actually, a few years later, uh, something happened that made us and our families very close. Uh, I got uh, a surprise call in late 85. Uh, Tali uh, was coming to MIT as a postdoc. I, I was at that time a, P a PhD student and he was looking for a place. So we invited him to stay with us um, and indeed he found a place uh, nearby. At that time we first met Oria she came to see the place to help Tali looking for the, uh, for the resident. And it turns out that when they stayed with us, there was a hurricane in Boston, Hurricane Gloria. Uh, they were locked in our apartment, uh, far away from the son, Avner, uh, who was a newborn. Our daughter was a year old, uh, two years old, I'm sorry. He was a... Um, a newborn, he, he, was, he stayed with the Oria's parents in New York. Um, Oria was very, very worried about it, um, but it was really an experience. And since then, indeed, Tali and I and our families become very close. Uh, we spend long time together in Boston, in, uh, in Cape Cod. We, we especially like the summers in uh, Woods Hall. Um, I was uh, associated with the Woods Oceanographic Institution. Many discussion on the beach later on in, in New Jersey when he did his, his, um, his um, when he was in Bell Labs, and of course in Israel for so many years our families were very close. So you can see some old pictures. If you look at those pictures, you can see Tali with this is our two children. I mean, Liat is now 39 years old, and Avner, I suppose, is 38 years old. Nir Stali playing with them. I suppose this is sometime back in 86 or something like that. And um, it was not just a friendship. Uh, we had many, many, many scientific discussions and we always uh, thought about collaboration. He taught me on chaos at the beginning and I reciprocated by talking about information theory. And I, when I told him that I'm interested in prediction and the relation between prediction and the data compression, uh, he thought it's a great idea and encouraged me to follow that. And he actually made the, the match with Neri Merhav, uh, with who I worked for many years. Uh, and, and we had some very nice results on the relation between prediction and the data compression. And Tali was around, his spirit, definitely. But then, go to the next slide. Uh, 
I must say that despite our so many discussions and so many things that we discussed about from physics to history to geography to to a foundation of life, biology, everything, uh, and of course information theory, um, we wrote only one paper together and only recently uh, in February 2020. Um, but we had a, but, but we had plans in the in the recent years. Uh, we had some lively discussions on the information bo a bottleneck, which is probably Tali's important, most important contribution to learning theory. And can you go to the next slide? Um, with this discussion, indeed, Tali realized and agreed how the information bottleneck is related to lossy compression and how, why learning in this setting is a, essentially a universal lossy compression problem for the features to predict the labels with log loss. And uh, we realized that the generalization bound that Tali provided consider the unknown decoder is a given encoder, but uh, we uh, he understood and we said that we will work together on understanding the effect of the unknown encoder that learned from the data on the ability to generalize and by this sort of close the theory and really understand the relation between information theory and information bottleneck to learning theory. Unfortunately, we didn't have the time and the chance to complete this mission and the problem is still open. And this is my last, sli my last slide. Um, well, I feel that I owe Tali to continue work on that problem that we um, devised together, that we defined together, to understand and substanti substantiate Tali's great insight to learning theory and to information theory. It's so, I'm so sad, it's so pity that Tali with his enthusiasm and insight left us um, so early. I will miss him a lot and our families all of us will miss him a lot. Thank you. Fernando? Uh, hi. Um, so I was, uh, when I was uh, preparing for, for this event, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite difficult to find the right thing to say. And I started looking through my old files that I still have my computer from from uh, when I was collaborating with Tali on the early work on the information bottleneck. And uh, so I, I met Tali the beginning of the 90s. I don't know the exact date. Um, I, we were both at Bell Labs and I was very, started to get interested in uh, distributional uh, clustering of words, how words uh, can be classified according to the context in which they occur. And uh, somehow, and I don't remember the details, uh, I, I came to talk to him. We introduced by someone else, I think Al, by Al Gorin. And uh, I started working, uh, start, we started discussing this. And, um, and our collaboration emerged very naturally, uh, you know, Tali's enthusiasm and, uh, and sort of very fast insight due to his uh, physics training. And one, one thing that is, to me was completely striking is how fast he could propose an approach and the solution. And I would like struggle after him and say, how, how did you go from that step to that step? And, and said, oh, there's, this is some high order factors you can ignore. And I say, how? You know, explain it to me. I'm just a mere computer scientist. I don't understand the, this. And that, that was one of these magic tricks as it were. I mean, it was something that I always in awe of because he could make these incredibly powerful inferential steps without uh, wi without wasting time in trying to do the, all the steps of a derivation. This is something I've never learned to do. It's a, it was a, a, a gift of a, both training and intelligence. Um, and he was uh, so generous in, in sharing those insights with me. And uh, 
So we started working and uh, with uh, my uh, intern Lillian Lee at the time, we, I, I, I and Lillian put together some empirical um, explorations of these clustering ideas and started trying, I started trying to implement the ideas that were emerging around the, that what became eventually the information bottleneck. Um, and this was all through the 90s as Tali moves back to Israel and we constantly exchanging emails and documents and drafts. So in one of those drafts, and I don't know the date of the draft because when I copied files from an old computer, the dates got all messed up, but it's sometime in the, I think late 90s, probably 96 or 97, uh, there was a, a document that I still have, a, a, a LaTeX file with comment at the top. And that comment is what I have here. Uh, and I, it, I just, it's a copy, exact copy with typos and all. And it, it's so revealing of his way of working and thinking. First of all, it's, it's, so it starts with a new formulation of the theory. This was what eventually, with work uh, collaborating with Bill, who talk, we'll talk later, came into the kind of the, the final initial formulation of the, the information bottleneck. Um, and he wanted... Uh, we had a draft paper that we wanted to submit, but it was not quite, the theory wasn't quite right. So he sends me this draft, new draft, and then he, he puts in capitals after we repeat the experiments. This is because, you know, even though he's so enthusiastic, he's always very careful to try to see, are we getting the, doing the right thing here? Uh, and this using the cluster weight, I won't go with the details of what that means, but, um, and in fact, I did read the experiments and they worked beautifully. Um, and then, I mean, this is uh, the second part, this is the second paragraph of his message. Uh, and uh, so he, he proposes write to paper, which became the information bottleneck paper, the 2000 paper. Uh, and, uh, and funny enough, and see where we can send it. So it, eventually we sent to this Allerton Conference in Information Theory. Uh, and uh, we never published it in a formal uh, journal or anything because one of the things of working with Tali is that he, what he cared most is about the science and, uh, and creating new ideas and new discoveries. Uh, the sort of the, the struggle to publish and get something into a particular refereed publication was never something he cared much about, which uh, I really admired because, you know, this commitment to pursuing the science, pursuing the truth uh, was and not rather than pursuing a career, which is what unfortunately many of uh, many in academia and industries only think about. Um, and uh, and then it's, it's at the bottom he says, I already have some new applications or method in your bio biological context, which I'd like to try while, while I'm here. And uh, and then he talks about some of the work on the fly visual system that then um, I think he ended up doing with Eli and others. And I mean, this is, I mean, j just the door is opening here. And some of the initial, the, these discoveries, which are way beyond anything that I was involved in, start piling up. Uh, and, um, and, the, and then the last, I, I, I look at this, I was reading this in the, a couple of days ago, and I say, this is amazing. This is the entire research program. You know, it is, you know, in the, in the late 90s, he was anticipating some of the things he worked on later uh, including at the bottom, it talks about extensions to uh, multivariate cases. Of course, he worked with, with his students at his university and then extensions to temporal processes, which is something that he con continued to explore in many different ways, including these ideas of information in life. And the, you know, the information bottleneck has a, a way of think framing the notion of memory in the living organism. Uh, and a predictive memory, memory that's useful to achieve a goal. Um, and of course, then the recent applications to the dynamics of uh, deep learning, where, uh, which in fact, uh, the last time I saw uh, Tal in person is when he came and gave a, a, this amazing talk that the room was completely packed at, uh, at, at Google before uh, on the... Um, on the application of the information bottleneck to the dynamics of deep learning, uh, which is kind of absolutely enthusiastic, the same way as ever. And of course, running out <laughs> always too many slides because too many ideas running, you know, time, time running out. And, and this is 
the, this is a constant experience of talking with him at any, any conference I met or when I visited in uh, visited him uh, in Israel that the he was overflowing with ideas but in a way it in a way that was so generous and so 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 uh, j alive and and uh, full of humor and also uh, humility because it's not that the, he was pushing that on you you say look what about this and and trying to engage you in this thinking and this way of, of uh, looking at problems. And so I, for me, the, the times I spent with him, I, I, I kind of ch cherish because uh, it was one of the most genuine, uh, warm, uh, insightful, uh, human, I mean, a, a full human being in the, at the best of what a human being can be sharing with another one their their knowledge their learning their their curiosity their their hopes uh, and not just with respect to science but whenever you know with respect to our families and respect to the to for instance when i visited him in israel respect to what the history of the country the history of the land uh the the complexities of life and i learned so much from him not just in science but about history about life in, in Israel, uh, about, uh, you know, being a, a good person. So I, I, I miss him a lot. Thank you. Bill? So um, I had a plan, but um, I, I have to start by saying how struck I am um, to see this collection of people. Um, I think one of the one of the measures of uh, of Tali, uh, as as Fernando said, as a, as a human being, um, is was is his, the the community that that swirled around him, um, and to look out and see people, uh, you know, it's it's hard to say I'm happy to see you because because of the weight of the occasion, um, but um, it really is extraordinary. Um, there are obvious cases like with Ilya, who's a who as a student worked both with me and with Tali. Um, there's Hanach, whom I, I'd known since before I knew Tali because he had the office next door to me when I was a postdoc at Santa Barbara. I could go on and on. There's this long stream of students who were influenced by Tali, who passed through Woods Hole, whom I got to know uh, during summers there. It's just that it's really um, uh, quite moving. Um, it's appropriate that I speak after Fernando um, because my first encounter uh, with Tali was hearing him speak um, about the work that that uh, uh, Fernando Tali and, and William Lee had done together, um, and uh, on on distributional clustering of words. And to get right to the heart of it, I, I think what Tali somehow brought out when he talked about it was his wonder that by doing statistics, it seemed you were getting at meaning. And that this was very deep. And I know that maybe, maybe that's not the thing one, one you know, meaning is, uh, is, is fraught. Um, but it was typical, I think, of, of Tali that he was always reaching for the deepest possible thing. And one has to admit that sometimes, you know, what is, I guess the phrase is that your, your reach exceeds your grasp. Um, but it was okay, because it was just incredibly inspiring. And it was, of course, that inspiration that led to these conversations that um, Fernando Tali and I had about, about the information bottleneck some years later, what became the information bottleneck. Um, and what's interesting is that I, have, I can picture the three of us at a very particular whiteboard in the not very inspiring building, which was the NEC Research Institute. Um, I cannot remember what time of year it was, I can't remember that, but I do have this, this image in mind of us, you know, sort of fighting through things at the board. Um, another thing which I heard Tali talk about very early on um, was his work with Moshe Abeles and Elon Vadia and others on, on uh, the description of the analysis of recordings from large numbers of neurons. Well, they weren't that large, wasn't that large a number in those days um, to try and uh, recover a description in terms of uh, discrete hidden states in the brain. And again, the reach was, was far, right? The, the hope was really um, to understand 
uh, states of mind, right? Uh, and that you could see this somehow reflected in the activity of this handful of neurons that that Owen was recording. And and I, although this is you know about personal recollections, I did go back and reread that paper last night. Um, it, it's remarkable, in part. Um, for its caution in, in crucial places. Uh, so he could, he could tell you what the grand picture was and then also tell you why, why you weren't quite sure it was right, but that was okay. Um, another great episode was when, when Rob DeGarter and I became directors of the summer course in Woods Hole. Um, we asked Holly to speak and we had this idea of pairing up theorists and experimentalists. And somehow we got the idea that with Tali, we were going to pair him um, with Alison Dope, who some of you will know, um, unfortunately also left us too soon, um, who worked on, on, on learning and, and signal processing and songbirds. And they had never worked together, but they produced this fantastic counterpoint of uh, theoretical ideas about signal processing and, and learning, um, both on the theoretical side uh, and, and then its experimental instantiation in, in the very beautiful example of the songbird. And, I, I don't think that at some level these were technically successful lectures. There was a lot to criticize, but the students um, found it incredibly inspiring. And actually, um, over the past weeks, I've had uh, exchanges with several of the students who were there, um, uh, some of whom have, have gone on to fabulous careers and as, on their own as scientists and, and as educators. Um, I want to say a few words that are really personal. Um, uh, I have a vivid memory of the very first time I was in Jerusalem, which was surprisingly late in my life. Uh, and um, uh, I was there, I was in Israel for a conference, had gone to Jerusalem for the day. Uh, there was a long dinner. There actually might be people in the room who were present at that dinner. I, I don't, I actually don't remember the full cast. Um, and things were getting to an end. And I said, you know, um, this is my first time in Jerusalem. I've never been to the old city. And Tali said, well, okay, we're going. And of course, everyone went along and um, we had this fabulous guide um, who began by taking us up onto the ramparts and uh, gesturing uh, to the east and explaining how far you had to walk to get to the Tigris and the Euphrates and uh, to the southwest, I guess, to how long you have to walk to get to the Nile. And then uh, gesturing to Gijon that, that, you know, here's a spring that provides fresh water all year round. Good. Now you know where you are. We can continue walking. Um, and it was uh, sort of typical of his, of, of his taste for, um, for his city, the city that he knew so well. Um, there's also a very memorable visit. Uh, many of you probably had this, a similar experience of going with him. Certainly many visitors did uh, of going with him through the, uh, on a trip through the Judean desert, which our, our family uh, did. Um, particularly notable was the moment where he explained that by tradition, this is actually where the goat for Azazel was sent, um, which uh, led me to ask uh, my son if he knew what we were talking about. He said, oh yes, that's actually my favorite story. So that was, a, um, he provided a moment also of connection with family. Um, there's one thing I wanna say at the end because it's one of, one of so there were so many conversations about things which are uh, at least as one says in American English, not the subject of polite conversation, which is to say religion and politics. Um, I, I understand it's different in Israel and I, I like that. Um, uh, he had, of course, um, uh, the conversation was somehow easy, even about things that are very personal. And um, I hope it's okay to share. He had many quips uh, about these rather serious matters. Uh, all characteristically thought-provoking. Um, and there's one that has always stuck with me, um, and I think it's okay to share it, which is he once remarked um, that he could go to shul more often if he didn't have so much trouble with the metaphysics. And um, well, like many of his quips, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. And um, this sense of always uh, having a very long reach, uh, maybe beyond one's grasp, as Fernando said, and as, as Mayor said, it leaves us inspired uh, to go on working ourselves and remembering him. Thank you. Nati? Yeah. Uh, okay. My uh, first encounter with uh, Tali 
Tali had the period of time between his uh, military service and his postdoc, where he was the, the chief uh, scientist of a small startup company. The word didn't exist then. We didn't even know what to call it. Uh, this uh, company was called Sesame. It was based near Barilan University to those who know about a 50 minutes uh, drive from, from Jerusalem. Uh, they had uh, a management that was very good in, in, uh, in collecting uh, strong scientists and engineers and not so good in, in running the company. So the company went other, under uh, rather quickly. Uh, and uh, among others, uh, they, they uh, got me to, to uh, uh, as an uh, outside advisor, once a week I would come there. And since I don't like to drive, and Tali was a very enthusiastic driver, the, the arrangement was obvious that, uh, and we were neighbors, so he would pick me up in the morning and, and drive me back to Jerusalem at the end of the day. And while we were on the way, that, that was the first I knew of him, but I, we never met uh, before. And uh, during, on the way, he, he told me all sorts of fascinating things about astrophysics and uh, many things that uh, I was very, very curious to know. Uh, these, these drives were really uh, a, a huge fun and, and we really enjoyed very much talking to each other. And, and we learned uh, many, many things. Uh, in this company. So the startup, you know, I'll tell you just a, a, a one, uh, for example. Uh, so th this was the, the, as the, perhaps as the name indicates, the Sesame, it was uh, supposed to, the, the goal of the company was to work on uh, human speech. And so uh, Tali and I were looking for ways to create a, a voice signature. I can completely, well, I had some experience from my military service, but I was much more of a mathematician than, than an engineer. And I remembered my classes in approximation theory from undergraduate. So I told him, listen, I know, I know I had this class. We should approximate everything as well as we can with Chebyshev polynomials. They're great at this. And we were able to get fantastically good approximations, except when we tried one more signal that we didn't see before, it, the whole thing completely collapsed. And this was uh, the first time I understand that I understood what uh, overfitting is. So we learned many, many fundamental things. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, soon. Uh, uh, many, many things which are completely obvious to students today, of course, were not known at the time. And at some point, uh, so I, I, the whole thing of working with Tali was, was hugely enjoyable. And at some point he, he told me that he might be interested in, in, in joining the university. I was completely enthusiastic about this, except there was two problems that at the time, kids like myself were not even supposed to speak about hiring. And secondly, when I brought this candidacy, the, the first uh, replies that I got is why, why do we need a physicist in a computer science department? And I tried and I knocked on all doors and I actually already gave up. And at some point somebody came back to me and said, okay, we decided to hire your friend. I was, you know, if, if there is one good thing that I did in, in university politics, that's it, that I managed to, to get through these walls and bring Tali to the university. We had uh, many, lots and lots of, uh, discussions and so on. And, and for example, while uh, you know this was still debated in the department, people said, yeah, who needs uh, uh, human speech? We just heard that IBM closed their, their group in that area and so on. And I came back to Tani and said, they don't like human speech. What, what, what should I tell them? And, and his answer was, I, I work on human machine interaction. The whole thing of, of machine learning didn't exist at the time. So he really, I could say, founded the subject at the, at, the, at the university. He was really a pioneer in many, many ways. And let me take 20 more seconds and tell you, you know, many people here told about things that they heard from Tali and influenced their career. Let me just briefly tell you one thing that, you know, that's, that's an idea that I still owe him and myself to, to develop. 
We, have, we had only one project at the early days of bioinformatics. We classified, we clustered all known proteins at the time. And I remember there was a saying that he told me once, you theoreticians, you don't know what you're talking about. Clustering is either easy or uninteresting. I think that's a very deep statement. And uh, this still awaits, I think this is one of the major projects that, that theoretical computer science should carry out to study the geometry of the input space to understand where the interesting inputs are, where the uninteresting inputs are, where the hard inputs are, where the easy inputs are. We know too little about this, and this is still part of Tali's vision that uh, I hope we'll get to, to, to develop one day. I think at this point, uh, there is no need to, to repeat this. Uh, such a rare individual, it's such a huge loss, and so early, we'll miss him all. Thank you. Thank you, Nati. Eli. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So Tali was a towering presence in my life. He was a teacher, a collaborator, and a friend. Uh, the truth is that uh, Tali's career as teacher, as my teacher, was a short one. Uh, I first met Tali as a woman. During my military service in the 1980s, we visited the units, army unit, in which his name was mentioned with all. Later, I encountered signs of him in places as unlikely as the musicology department, where one summer I developed some programs that he wrote a few years earlier for extracting pitch from singing. At some point, Tali made a short appearance as an actual person. He TA'd in, I believe, the analytical mechanics course that I had as a second year physics undergraduate. Frankly, I don't remember who was the teacher of that course, but I definitely remember the exercise sessions with Tali. And then he disappeared again. And the game continued when Tali joined Hebrew University just as I left for my postdoc in the US. Only after my return to Hebrew University as a faculty member, Tali became at last a stable presence. And our formal collaboration started around 1999 and is or was, uh, is actually ongoing since. As I was trying to summarize my work with Tali, I was reminded of a metaphor that I first read in a poem by Victor Hugo called The Exiled Seed. Uh, Hugo describes the impressions of a traveler looking for the tallest summit of the Pyrenees, the Pic du Midi, as he walks away from the feet of the mountains near the Atlantic Ocean and into the plain. When the traveler is too close to the mountains, he only sees the lower summits that lie nearby and only when he is far enough, Hugo's traveler is capable of perceiving the majestic presence of the tallest mountain. In the poem, the trip takes three days. My trip into Tali's ideas took 21 years, and I'm not sure that it reached its terminus. So with Gal Chechik, Tali taught me why mutual information is useful for studying brain processes. And we had a lot of fun playing around with these lower summits. Then, stepping a bit further away with Jonathan Rubin, I was able to perceive more of the big picture. Uh, Jonathan's work was our first successful application of the information bottleneck method to neural data. And only then, I had enough of a grasp of Tali's big research program in order to propose using his synthesis of information bottleneck and control theory as a tool for describing animal behavior and its underlying neural mechanisms, a work that we started with Nadav Amir and is ongoing as we speak. Because that was Tali's great ambition, as was already mentioned. The tallest summit, which took me so long to perceive and then only faintly, was to reduce the huge variety of biological phenomenology into a few basic principles from information theory that will explain them all. Of course, not all of these ideas were mature in 1999 when we started collaborating. So you can obviously ask why I embarked on this long trip with Tali. And this touches upon other aspects of Tali, which between myself and myself, I call for lack of better term terminology, his soft features. Tali was older and incomparably wiser than me. He could provide advice and support when things were hard. He was principled and had the courage to send for his, for his principles to the point of silliness, and yet was much more practical than I ever was. Most importantly, he was a friend. 
and there was a warmth in him that made it a pleasure to simply spend time in his presence. I think that this is a good moment to show me what I think still symbolizes best our work together. Yair, if you could switch to, to the slide. This is a figure from a paper of Jonathan Rubin on the application of information or the information bottleneck principle to the coding of surprise by neurons in auditory cortex. And what I want to convey here is the nature of the collaboration between Tali and me. The numbers along the abscissa were calculated by physics, okay, if you wish. The principled application of the information bottleneck to the experimental paradigm that we used without reference to any data. The numbers along the ordinate are biological measurements, in this case, neural responses of a neuron in auditory cortex with no reference to any theory. And the two are highly correlated. Thus, the information bottleneck principle that Tali Pioneer turns out to account for what happened into a real neuron, in a real brain, in a real experiment. And in the next slide, I would like just to show you the most important thing about this figure. Mm -hmm. It symbolizes so well our 20 years of work together. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ali Mira. Thanks. Um, it's, it's strange in the sense that Ellie actually didn't have to show this slide because I have this slide in my mind's eye. I've seen it so many times and, and I grew into it. I grew into it. But actually the first time I met Ali was many years ago. Uh, like Ali, it was in my first year, well, in my first year as a student of biology at the Hebrew University, it was early 80s. And Tali was a PhD student in physics, and he was my TA in the physics lab during the first semester at the university. Now, physics lab posed a real big challenge for biologists. And most biology students were not really happy with its weekly colloquia up at the end of each lab. Afterwards, I haven't seen Tali for almost 10 years. I think I first met him again upon his return to the Hebrew University as a senior lecturer. And at the time, I was in advanced stages of my PhD. We met in one of the interdisciplinary brain seminars that were organized by Tali and others who together founded what would later become the Huji Center for Computational Neuroscience in whatever name it has at each time. Tali recognized me immediately after so many years. I was really surprised. I mean, I was no ways in physics lab and neither did we have any specific talks beyond the lab time. So when I asked him about it, he replied that it was clear to him that I had a keen urge to understand. That was true. The surprising aspect is that Tali appreciated this urge in other people beyond actual factual knowledge, the drive and the interest which he always had Interestingly, also so in others, and I guess appreciated. And this brought me to the question of when we say, okay, he had the urge to understand. What do we mean when we say to understand? And I think that Tali's answer was quite clear, to capture as much as possible with as little assumptions as possible. Or in other words, he was really an extreme reductionist. And for me, it meant a pure, wholehearted physicist. Tally believed that informational bottleneck capture captures roughly everything, evolution, human cognition, among others, deep networks. It is the basic principle. And this immensely broad conceptualization is really inspiring, even though as a, an experimentalist, it yielded challenges to our collaboration. And Tally was passionate about collaborating with experimentalists. However, experimentalists need to know how and what to analyze in the piles of data that we collect, which is also influenced by detailed experimental conditions whose relation to basic principles is really not transparent. So interaction was challenging, and yet it was extremely influential for me, both as a researcher and actually as a person. I think I have informational bottleneck at the back of my mind, roughly all times. 
For me, it means that acquiring and keeping information is costly. And the process of understanding is really the gradual learning of what is worth keeping for the task that we have in mind, and sort of dropping much of the others. When I think about it, I believe that Tali would have liked my broad use of informational bottleneck, even though he would have preferred it to go beyond my intuition and to be much more quantifiable and mathematically much more sound. And I thank you, Tali. Thank you, Merav. Daniel? I'm trying to speak from this camera. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, it will be a bit easier. So um, I am very sad to be at this event, not because of the illustrious company, but obviously because of the occasion. Um, but I do think it's a good time to remember um, what brilliant scientists we are uh, essentially commemorating. So my first encounter with him was not exactly a meeting. Um, in fact, it was 1993 in the learning days. Uh, this was, I think, the opening of, of the, brain, uh, of the uh, brain science institutes. And I was then a PhD student sitting in the audience. And I remember that there was one guy who gave a really interesting talk. I'm not sure I, I, I reconstructed fully, maybe clustering, information theory, and some things kind of in the vague memory still remind me of what later became, of course, um, the bottleneck. But at that time, I didn't know that, of course, nobody knew. Uh, Tali probably had uh, already an idea. And he gave this talk, and I remember him. I, I don't think I've spoken to him, but, you know, it, it stuck. Anyway, fast forward several years, I became interested in agents and how agents distinguish relevant from irrelevant information. And I was struggling with the question, how do you do this, right? How Shannon explicitly threw out semantics. I'm here quoting, quoting uh, Bill a little bit. He threw out semantics um, in a way, and this was actually what we wanted to put in again in information theory, how to do that. And so while I was struggling, I found a paper by Sami Kaski who quoted some information bottleneck paper. I thought, okay, that sounds like it might be the thing. So I read there, I thought, yes, this is the thing. And from there, everything just unrolled easily. Everything suddenly makes sense. You had information that was relevant and information that was not relevant. The separation of information, the inner structure of information, treating information almost like a fluid or the, that has inner structure when an entity of discourse, that was a completely new insight. Anyway, years passed and I did my stuff uh, using uh, uh, these, these works, work on agents and relevant information, etc. And I got an invitation to a workshop uh, at the NIPS in 2006, and uh, the workshop was co-organized by Tali. I thought, oh, that's great. Um, I have an opportunity to meet this great man. So I went there, and as it happened, we got off right away. We had uh, great discussions, and you know, as they say in the movie, this was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So quite late, but fortunately not too late to have the opportunity to meet this uh, this amazing, um, well, uh, unbelievably uh, um, fertile scientist. And um, we ended up organizing a couple of workshops. One of the workshops, the next we organized was actually 2008, again at NIPS. And I uh, relate a little event there. Um, he said to me, yes, at the end of the workshop, the more junior scientist has, the junior scientist of this uh, organizer has to give a summary of what happened in the workshop. Sure, no problem. Says, yes, but it has to be funny. <laughs> okay, right. So in the whole week, instead of listening to the talks, I was wondering, how can I make a funny presentation at the end? It was really, 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 really difficult. Fortunately, a good friend of mine, he, um, I don't know how it happened, he inspired me, and we, we ended up basically doing a show and tell. So basically, I had a bag of, of rubbish stuff, and I showed them to the audience, and they had to guess the objects and what what that would mean in terms of a scientific term. It was very funny, but uh, to, to be honest, uh, it took basically the gag was prepared half an hour before the presentation. So it was a bit stressful. 
Um, of course, um, another funny, uh, not, not funny, but uh, interesting uh, experience was um, when we discussed the paper on perception action loop and how to model agents and how to model them in basically with a, with a bounded rationality constraint uh, or what today we would call bounded rationality constraint. Um, I was actually at a RoboCup competition and we were hot in the development of stuff, but Tali had time and I thought, okay, I don't, I don't care. I'm going to talk to Tali. And so I was sitting on this table in the middle of this very noisy conference or, or actually competition. And it was quite loud and we're sitting on Skype. I was trying to listen in and we had this absolutely wonderful and very, very productive discussion. I think I should do that again um, about the perception action loop and how to model it and the, the, how certain terms would disappear if you put them together in the right form. So that was uh, definitely an experience. Uh, it took still some time before the paper came out, but essentially this was, this was um, uh, one distinct uh, memory I have. And of course, in 2016, he organized this uh, beautiful workshop and or symposium rather in Jerusalem, where he took us on the nightly tour through the old city just before the high holidays. So that was uh, the atmosphere was, was absolutely magical. And he took us to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and explained how it was refurbished and what they found. And, and it was clear that he had a, not just an encyclopedic knowledge of not, not just science, but history, politics but an operational knowledge. He knew how things fit together. Everything was like um, gears that, that fit into each other and suddenly things make sense. So this was all encompassing. His curiosity was science probably primarily, but everything else too. And basically I would like to start concluding with making clear that what he did was not an isolated thing. The information bottleneck, as I said, is about portioning of information to important, unimportant parts. It has influenced a lot the whole development of um, bounded rationality, what today people would call the information theoretic bounded rationality um, regularization. It has informed also other things. For example, the predictive information, um, which was an essentially um, my big insight when I read that paper, my big insight about understanding what is complexity. It was a brilliant way of modeling complexity with people we are having big fights about what the right way is. And this, of course, if you uh, know the work by Shalazy, he showed that predictive information together with the bottleneck gives you a generalization of the epsilon machine, essentially of the predicting um, Markov, uh, a predictive Markov machine. Then there's, of course, uh, the work that um, essentially um, uh, Ralph Deer and Yat I and Georg Matthews did about using predictive information in agents for um, intrinsic motivations. And uh, one very, very fascinating paper that uh, Tali wrote with Pedro Ortega about agents in the nature of time, an absolutely fascinating paper, really recommended reading. And if you look at all these things, I think it has just scratched the surface. He understood so much more that he could actually commit to paper. He, there was this bottleneck where, where this understanding was so vast and this had to squeeze through this temporal bottleneck of actually writing paper. So I think we have just started the, the time where we understand what, what's going on in this field has only just begun. And sometimes I feel like I, when I open Zoom, I still see his tab there, and I feel like, oh, I, let's just take that, let's see whether he's free. And then I remember um, that unfortunately we can't. And um, yes, I still uh, haven't got used to it, and I will miss him, as we probably all. Thank you. Yoram? I would like to share the screen, please. Uh, um, this is a very difficult uh, moment for me. Um, this is my very last uh, picture of Tali from my personal archive. Um, I will get back to this picture uh, in a few minutes. Um, I was very fortunate to be uh, part of the very first group of uh, Tali's PhD students together with Dana Ron and um, Shlomo Dubnov. Um, 
So for first, for a very brief period in time, we could get a lot of tally personal time, um, you know, hours of discussions in his office. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately for me, this, this sort of uh, period where I could spend a lot of time with Tali very quickly uh, vanished. Um, after us, there was very quickly, you know, the lab just got full and full. Um, Itai got to join and Shai to find and Ron Elianiv um, uh, was visiting and all wanted Tali's attention. And then we had also to fight with the adults, um, Eli Shamir and Nati from the computer science department, Karim Sampolinsky, Sebastian Sung showed up. And then long discussions that Tali had with uh, Idan about the new center. Um, but let me beg, go back to this sort of fortunate period of almost uninterrupted um, time and about and talk about very shortly about a paper, not from a technical perspective, but um, from a personal perspective. So Tali has actually gave me my first research problem. I was very fortunate, he dished it to me. Um, and it was about um, the um, mathematical model of um, the motor control system in humans. And we, he taught me how to take off my engineering hat and look at it as a as, um, uh, communication task. It, look at the task of uh, handwriting as a um, communication problem over a noisy channel uh, with physical constraints. Anyone who worked with Tally would actually can tell the line by his toe. Just, just this sentence is actually etched in my memory. So look at the problem as a communication problem in over a noisy channel. Um, we spent actually quite a bit of time on this problem. We poured our hearts into it. Um, we looked into, we built a system. We argued a lot. But more surprisingly, we agreed more often than we argued. And um, if I uh, look back, it's one of my fondest memories of, of my research. Um, Tali um, encouraged me to look for a compact, compact latent representation of, of characters. Um, and he made beautiful connections to optimal control, which I capitalized upon. Eventually, we built a system using um, a technique that these days during the uh, deep learning days is, you know, maybe people have neglected and um, it's called analysis by th synthesis. So once we cleaned, when once we received the, the um, clean signal, we could resynthesize the original uh, denoise signal. And I asked Tally, let's find a long word to test the system, but this is like the, you know, the birth of the system. And unsurprisingly, Tali chose the following. What you see here is really the first word that was um, denoised and synthesized by, by our system. Um, and this paper of mine, my very first journal paper, um, is the one actually that I cherish the most. Um, I had to go to, through the crucible of you know, becoming the full professor eventually that makes you write a lot of papers. But if I have to recall one paper that I poured my heart into and I like the most, this, this is the paper. Fast forward years later, Tully was you know, a generous and noble man. And I think that a testament uh, to this was his ability to collaborate, to speak, to talk, to engage with his former students. And about eight years after this paper, maybe nine, I joined the Hebrew University as a professor. Then another generation came and Shai, Sh and Shai Shalev joined. And another generation came and uh, Amit Danieli, we are, we're all professors under Tali or with Tali in the same institution. And uh, something that is very rare. 
And just as a last story, we were all, I was actually visiting from the US and getting to uh, get this picture was a task. The only way I, I could get tell to the free time of Tali on that day of my visit was to write him an email titled the Neo Information Bottleneck that caught his attention. And this trick actually was, you know, made us uh, facilitate uh, facilitated this picture. Um, I have a request to Tali's uh, students and, and uh, academic children and academic um, grandchildren and academic grand grandchildren. Uh, children. The mathematical genealogy uh, project is as a page on Tali, but it, the page doesn't have all of us. Please go and update the page, add your name, your you know, direct PhD students, students of students, and student of student of students. Thank you, Yaron. Amir? Yes, can we go back to the main slide? Uh, yes. Oh, I, I can take over here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's on. Oh, are you presenting or am I? I am. Right. Do you want to present? Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, I'm just missing the screen now. What do you want me to show? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I can't see the main screen now. Can you see my screen? Now, uh, now you go ahead and share there. Okay. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes. Ah, okay. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, so yes, Tali was a very meaningful uh, person and presence uh, in my life. Uh, for large parts of my life, he was my longest uh, relationship uh, in a way. Um, certainly, as a grad student, uh, and uh, when I think back of him uh, recently. These are the images that come to my mind. I think, uh, you know, Tali was uh, an incredible uh, speaker. I, I vividly remember the first time I heard him speak. Uh, I was uh, an undergrad. He was speaking about the work with uh, Fernando and uh, Lillian Lee. Uh, and I thought it was amazing. I think Tali had this uh, capacity to, whenever he spoke about something, you, he conveyed the, you know, the feeling that this was the most important, in, interesting thing in the world. And most often <laughs> it really was. Uh, and he was excited about it. I think this was a word that came up, you know, uh, in previous people talking about him. I think the sense of excitement when he was talking about his work, uh, you know, either in public or uh, in one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. And I, you know, I, I tried to find, it was easy to find the uh, you know, pictures that convey this uh, uh, sensation you know, of Tali being super <laughs> enthusiastic uh, as he speaks about uh, uh, his work. Uh, so that, that's, that's the image of him uh, uh, that stayed in my mind. Um, and you know, that, that what uh, made me uh, really want to work with him as a, as a graduate student and many of, many of us uh, here. Uh, and that leads to the, the, all of ac the Tali's academic descendants, Joram was talking about this. And I think it's very safe and you know, uh, a very fair description to say that Tali is the father of uh, machine learning in Israel. Uh, so he has uh, uh, academic descendants uh, as faculty and practically all uh, academic institutes in Israel. I added a few while this was uh, going on since I recognize people uh, in the audience for, for some of the universities I forgot. Uh, so, uh, and beyond Israel, of course, and I think he's, he's influenced. Certainly, you know, the, the fact that Israel has such a strong ML uh, presence now uh, worldwide uh, with very strong uh, people here uh, and, and uh, abroad is, is a lot due to Tali's, uh, um, you know, the tree that he started. And I think uh, Yoram is right that we should uh, you know, uh, contribute to, to uh, filling uh, um, formally now. Um, and I was thinking, you know, why is it that uh, this, you know, this happened that, uh, you know, one person essentially grew this uh, great tree of, of uh, researchers that uh, um, you know, covered, covered this important field uh, uh, so well. And you know, just some things came to my mind that I wanted to share. 
uh, you know, th thinking back on you know the, the many years I had uh, uh, spent with Tali as, as an advisor. And uh, so one, I think, you know, this came up here uh, multiple times is the search for principles and fundamental laws, you know, not, not anecdotal things, but really things that resemble physical uh, laws, uh, you know, that you can write in equations or in very uh, simple uh, graphs, you know, so this is the famous uh, movie. Can you see this move? Uh, yes. So, so this is, you know, anyone who's known Tali for uh, uh, one year and more has seen this uh, beautiful uh, movie, right, which is sort of, this is a, this movie itself is a theory, it's, a, it's an elegant theory of uh, deep learning, right, and I think it's phenomenal that, that, uh, that you can, uh, in, in a simple, you know, a figure or a simple movie convey a deep theory. I think this is, this really captures Tali's, uh, uh, you know, science making. Uh, so I think that's one thing, the search for principles and laws, uh, uh, you know, like trade-offs and variance and uh, you know, the information bottleneck really uh, embodies that uh, philosophy, I think. Another is this uh, view of, of science making as a long journey uh, whose goal is to explore, you know, core uh, concepts like information, uh, perception, so not, not just, uh, you know, uh, paper publishing, like uh, Fernando said, but really to take a, a topic that's at the core of, you know, intelligence and, and beyond and, and to explore that in all its uh, depth uh, uh, across uh, many years of, of exploration. I think that that's, uh, and certainly enthusiasm and commitment is, is part of that. Uh, another is maybe made, it's, it's a personal uh, experience of mine, but uh, talking to Tali as a, as a grad student, there was this feeling he walked into his office and there was like a one hour of sort of a stream of consciousness, which covered many you know, fields from uh, Mesopotamia uh, to particle physics and learning uh, many different things with a lot of like technical uh, uh, insights and things that you really had to, you know, they came out of Tali's very broad, a view of, of the world and, and his many uh, skills and strengths and you sort of had to piece it apart afterwards and and you know and, uh, and there was always you know uh, once you you thought about it once and twice and <laughs> a dozen times uh, you there was so much you could take from it and I think in in retrospect you could see how uh, how that shaped your uh, our research uh, uh, you know views and uh, and paths uh, so I thought that was uh, that was a great experience, and I, I thank Tali for that. Uh, yeah, as, as I said uh, again, this was the, the search for elegance and simplicity. Like I have this, you know, memory of Tali when when something converged to something that was, you know, this had this sort of self-evident uh, 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 correctness and, and elegance. You know, this that Tali's satisfaction in these uh, moments. I think uh, you know, it projected back to us as students. You know, that this was. The thing to to strive for, uh, and again the, the the last point which I think came up in everyone's uh, uh, words is Tali's really core enthusiasm and and this curiosity. It's just the, the level of energy that that he brought was amazing and, and contagious, and and I think you know in, in a way it's something that also during his uh, years of illness uh, I think this was something that uh, helped him you know battle the the, the illness and even be fantastically productive in these years. So I will uh, miss him uh, very much and thank him for what he's done for me and for all of us. Thank you. Noga? Um, so all the previous speakers um, described uh, Tali's scientific greatness so well. So I would like to say just a few words about Tali, the academic parent that I was so fortunate to have. My journey with Tali started about a decade ago when I was an undergrad student. And a bit later, I began my PhD with him. We initially planned to work on scaling laws in language, um, but similar to what uh, Amir mentioned, I quickly learned that um, discussions with Tali were unpredictable and uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Scaling laws in language led to perception action cycles, which then led to phase transitions and the information bottleneck, which then led to a new understanding of deep learning. And eventually we returned back to language, but from a different angle. 
And this trajectory could characterize not just the PhD with Tali, but also every single conversation with him. Even if we had a well-defined task discussed, for example, preparing a class for the next day in his course that I was TAing, there was very little predictive information about how the discussion will develop and if it would take 20 minutes or four hours. At first, I felt like um, these were just fun intellectual detours. Um, but in Tali's mind, nothing was a detour and everything was deeply connected. And for years, I tried to figure out how that's possible. Um, but at some point when different pieces of the puzzle started to fall into place, that felt just incredible. And to be honest, um, I don't think Tali knew in advance exactly how everything um, would roll out, but I believe he knew that eventually things will fall into, into place. And so what seemed like uh, detours was actually him guiding me through his extraordinary thought process. And with time, I realized just how much the discussions with him shaped not only my scientific, scientific perspective, but how I think and navigate in the world. So above all, Tali gave me um, a compass to use in my research. And not only that, I believe uh, he wanted to see his students find their own way in the jungle using that compass. So at one point in the middle of my PhD, I wanted to explore a new research direction about language using formation bottleneck and related tools we had been working on. And although it was not exactly what Tali had planned, he was more than supportive. He empowered me to pursue this direction of mine uh, and to establish uh, new collaborations around the world. He made sure I didn't give up even when things seemed hopeless. And he continuously offered his insight and sprinkled his magical enthusiasm on top of everything. I cannot think of uh, a greater gift an advisor could give to a student. Around the same time, Tali was uh, constantly being invited to give talks about um, the information bottleneck and deep learning. And so he traveled a lot. Um, we continued to have our uh, regular research meetings, but that was mainly on Skype. That was a pre-pandemic era when Skype was still a thing. And Tali would often connect from different places around the world. One time I was surprised to find him Skyping from an RV in the middle of nowhere. Um, but that turned out to be actually not a business trip, but a family vacation in New Zealand. And so there was re really never a dull moment with Tali. I was also fortunate to be with, uh, with Tali in uh, a few tours uh, he had in the US. We spent some time together at Berkeley at a couple of conferences. And shortly after I started my postdoc, he visited MIT. And Tali's talks were always packed. His excitement propagated to everyone in the room. And like a rock star, he was surrounded by so many people who wanted to grasp more of his inspirational ideas. And so these amazing adventures uh, with Tali happened while he was fighting, um, this was, was fighting cancer. He did not let the disease distract him from his quest for the deepest principles of intelligence. And I believe his research also helped him fight the disease. He continued to mentor students and offer his uh, special compass. And I know I will continue to carry that compass with me wherever I go, but that will never be the same without Tali. And I will miss him so much. Uh, thank you, Noga. Um... I'll just um, show this uh, slide again um, to mention, uh, so we had, uh, I think so, something like 150 people in the Zoom today uh, and only a few of us could speak. So I'm sure there are many more people who would like to share their memories. Uh, and it's for this purpose that we here at the university are creating the Tali Tishbi Memorial blog uh, and we've already received some submissions and we encourage every, anyone who has just a story, a video, a picture, anything you'd like to share, uh, send it to this email address over here. 
and we will curate these. Also, the uh, genealogy that Yola mentioned, we will link to that. And there will, of course, also be a, a video uh, of today, uh, just uh, very different ways in which we will uh, continue to commemorate uh, Tali Tishmi. So thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to end the session now. Thank you. <laughs>